without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to our chair tonight, um, Suki Sanger. Uh, so many of you will, will know Suki. Um, after joining Unite, uh, her union, she got involved with the youth structures and later got involved in Black, Asian and minority ethnic structures within the union. Suki's represented both young and Black workers on the STUC General Council, and she's currently involved in the Workers' Stories Projects, which was set up at the start of the pandemic as a way of making sure that stories of workers uh, were getting told and recorded in this unique period of history and um, sort of preserved for generations to come. Prior to becoming a trade union organiser, Suki worked in the third sector for 10 years, um, mainly in youth employability work, um, and we're super delighted she's here today to chair our discussion with Eve. So I will pass over to you, Suki. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Hi, everyone. Um, Firstly, I just want to say how excited I am actually about this discussion uh, at this event today. I was just talking to even the others about um, having read the book um, just recently and just how much of the book resonates with my own experiences and some of the discussions that I have with colleagues and friends um, about the trade union movement. So um, very much looking forward to some of the discussion in the event today. So um, I know time is short, so I'm just going to get kick started and I am going to just firstly give you a little bit of an introduction to Eve Livingston. So Eve is a freelance journalist specialising in inequalities, industrial relations and social affairs. She has written for The Guardian, The Independent and Vice, amongst many others, and has appeared on TV and radio, including BBC Women's Hour and ITV News. And in 2019, she was shortlisted for the Orwell Prize and Amnesty Media Award for a coverage of the equal pay strikes in Glasgow. Um, and we're delighted to, um, to have Eve here along today to talk about her book, Make Bosses Pay and Why We Need Unions. But before we get on to the discussion part of the event, we are going to, I'm going to hand over to Eve and um, we're going to get a short reading of some of Eve's book. I believe it's chapter four, Beyond Equality and Diversity in the Case for Liberatory Unionism, uh, if I'm right. So I'm going to hand straight over to Eve uh, for a short reading. Yeah, thank you, Suki, and thank you everyone for coming along. Um, as Suki said, this um, reading is from the very beginning of uh, the chapter that's called Beyond Equality and Diversity, the case for a liberatory unionism, um, which I think is something we'll probably go on to discuss a bit more, but um, it's the chapter that looks at um, most explicitly, um, although I hope it's woven through, but at kind of uh, women's involvement and um, the involvement of marginalised workers and, and trade unionists in the movement. Um, so, this is, yeah, chapter, start of chapter four. When Jaya Ben Desai walked off her job at the Grunwick Film Processing Factory in London's Wilsdon in August 1976, she probably didn't know that she was to become something of a poster girl for discussions of equality and representation within the labour movement. Likely she was thinking of the long hours she'd worked over a record hot summer or the meagre wages she'd been paid in return or the lack of respect she'd been treated with by managers who, among other impositions, required workers to ask permission before using the toilet. Either way, Desai walked off the job, setting in motion two years of strike action, a bitter split within the labour movement, and a contentious narrative of racial and gender equality as it applies to trade union history. The Grunwick factory workers, mostly employed to manually develop other people's holiday photos, were mainly female and of South Asian origin. They primarily came from families who had settled in East Africa during colonial rule and who had subsequently been expelled after those countries gained independence from Britain. Bosses such as those, such as those at Grumwick capitalised on this new migrant workforce who they assumed to be submissive and willing to accept poor paying conditions and their desperation for work. But those bosses were wrong. And on Friday the 20th of August 1976, despite not being members of a union, Desai led a group of workers out on strike in protest at their poor treatment by management. What began as a small scale protest endured as seasons changed and both sides held out, but support for the Grumwick strikers grew, with large marches across London and visits of solidarity from prominent trade unionists, including Arthur Scargill of the National Union of Mine Workers. The Grumwick strike marks a historic moment in union history, so the narrative goes. Migrant women taking action for themselves, a previously fra fractured, often racist and misogynistic trade union movement uniting behind them, an exercise in solidarity and union values. It was, after all, just eight years earlier that London's dockyard workers marched in support of Enoch Powell and that the women of Dagenham's Ford factory had to overcome male hostility to strike for equal pay. But it wasn't to last. After two years, under pressure from the government when the strikers rejected all attempts at compromise, the TUC withdrew support for the strike and left the Grumwick women out in the cold. 
not even a hunger strike outside the TUC's headquarters could regain their support. The women were forced to give up, with Desai commenting, trade union support is like honey on the elbow. You can smell it, you can feel it, but you cannot taste it. In Maya Goodfellow's book, Hostile Environment, Dr. Sanduri Anitha, whose work focuses on the Grumwick strike, calls this narrative into question. There were many other disputes where South Asian women were active before, she says. They aren't in our consciousness because they weren't supported and therefore they failed. It's not an exception that they stood up to fight for their rights. They'd been doing it a long time before and they've done it for a long time since. In response, Goodfellow writes, when people celebrate Grumwick as a rare moment of migrant resistance or fetishize the women involved as strikers in saris, they reproduce the stereotype of Asian women as submissive, passive bystanders in history. But the UK's history of racist legislation and exploitative working conditions, it should always be remembered, is one of resistance. So the story of Grumwick strike teaches us three lessons that despite stereotypes of male breadwinners, the most bold and effective action is often taken by the most marginalized workers. That solidarity has not always been extended as unconditionally to these workers as to their white male counterparts. And that narratives about these struggles are contested and often manipulated by those who would seek to undermine them. The latter of these is a dilemma the union movement continues to grapple with. On the one hand, very real issues exist and a great many brave and bold activists work tirelessly to highlight and challenge them. On the other, these struggles have often been capitalised on by those who care very little about liberatory politics, but who have a vested interest in discrediting trade unions. Their character, caricatures of smoke-filled rooms and gentlemen's agreements erase and undermine the brilliant organising work being done by women and other marginalised groups in arenas as diverse as fast food, outsourcing, cleaning, education and more. An already downtrodden and disempowered movement can be wary of challenging itself for fear of falling into this same trap or giving ammunition to its detractors. But it is vital that we do, for a movement that enshrines or perpetuates the very power relations that further marginalise workers is no movement at all. As we will explore, today's unionism can be seen as being in something of a transition period between the outright hostility and division faced by marginalised workers and union spaces prior to Grumwick and after it, and a model of unionism that truly accounts for the ways in which our class and material circumstances are reinforced and reproduced through, for example, our gender, race, sexuality or disability. While we find ourselves in a time where most unions and many members would surely renounce the bigotry woven through labour history, many union leaders have not yet responded beyond equality and diversity initiatives and a focus on representation, which, while often well-meaning, are incapable of bringing about the radical redistribution of power that marginalised workers need. When I call for a liberatory unionism, I refer to one that challenges this structure rather than working within its parameters. A unionism built on an understanding that women and disabled people suffer disproportionately at the hands of austerity, and that almost half of all trans people had to leave their jobs because they felt unwelcome that works to address the reality that black women are twice as likely as their white counterparts to be in insecure work and that the unemployment rate for young black men is rising more sharply and faster than for any other group. It makes us fundamental the truth that there can be no meaningful victories for the working class as a whole, so long as its most marginalized members are left on the sidelines. This path is not linear and its endpoint is not fixed, but until we move beyond the politics of representation and diversity to a model of liberatory unionism that understands and responds to the intersectional nature of these struggles, solidarity will continue to be extended conditionally to our most marginalised and our bosses will continue to divide and conquer. Thank you. Thanks Eve. I think that chapter in particular is also is just a great starting point for the discussion that we're going to have today, but also just lays bare all the contradictions that exist within the trade union movement and trade unions um, and some of the discussions that we're going to have today about, about what those contradictions are, how we overcome those um, contradictions, and most importantly why, despite those contradictions, it's so important that you're a member of a trade union. So I'm looking forward to that uh, discussion. So just to kick us off then, I'm going to start with the questions. So the first question that we uh, would like to pose to you, Eve, is I suppose a bit about your experience. So as a journalist, you do write about a range of different topics. Um, what made you decide to write a book about this particular area of work? Yeah, so um, it's interesting this. I've kind of, people have asked me this a lot because I think that to the kind of wider public, trade unions might seem like quite a niche interest, um, sadly. Um, and so people have kind of said to me, you know, like, why is that the path that you've gone down? Um, to me, it makes perfect sense. And that's because all my kind of work um, 
journalistically but also prior to going into journalism the kind of jobs that I did in the third sector and the public sector around like campaigns and equalities um, all my work's focused on kind of um, you know tackling inequalities um, achieving social justice all of that kind of thing and like the, the one lesson that I've learned from all that work is that the only way that we do that is collectively um, through you know unions in their broadest sense so all different types of unions and through um through people kind of working together with a shared aim really so to me like trade unions didn't seem that niche of a topic they felt like the key to all these conversations that we're all having every day about inequality and how to make things better and more equal um, and i wanted to take that argument to a kind of young audience who are obviously really conversations about climate and you know um housing and all of this kind of stuff but who um the, the, the figures suggest kind of aren't necessarily so engaged in trade union politics um so that was the sort of starting point um for it um yeah that, that, that was kind of the thinking behind it perfect what i love about the book so much is the honesty uh, around some of the issues and the challenges that unions face internally and outwardly as well um so i suppose what i'm interested in finding out about is what some of the reactions were to your book did you get any surprise reactions when it came out after people read it um it's an interesting question because i think i expected more surprise reactions than i got actually um because as you say it's not a it's not a book that's written to to kind of please the the trade union movement necessarily it's written in many senses to challenge the trade union movement and to say you know i'm someone who as i've kind of outlined there passionately believes in trade unions believes in the trade union movement believes they're the only thing that changes anything but who kind of recognizes a lot of issues in the way that they currently operate um and i didn't want to write a book that invited young people into a movement that was then not necessarily going to work in their interests or be very welcoming to them i wanted to make the argument that like you need to be in unions but you need to be prepared to do a bit of kind of work and a bit of challenge to um turn them into what they have the potential to be um so yes yeah, so i kind of expected a bit more backlash from it really um which i haven't touch wood had so far um i think people have been uh grateful actually probably in some corners of the union movement where um you know for good reason it's not really a, an argument that kind of people who are working as staff or elected officers can have in their roles because they're so busy with the kind of day-to-day -day operations of how things already run and um, so i think people have been quite grateful that there's something to start that conversation um and the, the you know the people i care about are the kind of young people that i was writing for and um, i've had like really nice feedback from them about um you know kind of the book doing what i wanted it to do which is to kind of inspire them to get involved and and not just join but um but be a part of the movement like building it and changing it from the inside um so that's been really nice um but yeah we'll we'll see if anything <laughs> any uh, negative uh, or surprise reactions come <laughs> Well, hopefully not. <laughs> um, just in terms of in terms of the book, I suppose um, sometimes a lot of the the conversations, a lot of the words that we use can be like a bit of jargon when we're talking about workers' power, when we're talking about organising and what that means. Because I know that it's been a, a a burst of energy around the organising agenda across various different unions over the last wee while. So I suppose um, just for the audience, maybe if you could talk a little bit about what we actually mean by workers' power. Yeah, so I think this is an interesting question. I suppose, like, first and foremost, what I mean by workers' power is actually pretty simple and it kind of relates back to what I've just said about people coming to workers coming together to act collectively, you know, in a kind of common interest and to shape the terms of the work that they're doing. Um, but I think, uh, I think part, part of what the book does is kind of talks about the model by which we might do that. And, and actually, it talks about how some unions. Um, have kind of moved away actually from building real power and have done what I've kind of characterized as like firefighting and kind of um, solving like individual grievances and making things better for individual workers, but not necessarily joining those dots to be like going out into new workplaces to be kind of doing the sort of political education stuff that keeps people involved and builds that power. And um, so I kind of make the case it's not enough just to define worker power as kind of the work, the stuff that trade unions do it needs to be you know actually building power and like doing the stuff that that builds power rather than that just kind of um yeah firefights or solves individual problems 
Um, so yeah, we, I mean, maybe we can talk a bit, a bit further about that, but I think that's one of the tensions in the book is kind of calling for this move towards, um, as you say, organizing, um, which I think is the way to build power rather than always just kind of, um, yeah, firefighting or even just activism actually, which obviously can be really, really good, but sometimes isn't enough to actually build um, relationships and power among people. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back to chapter four of the book, uh, which is the, the reading that you just did for us at the start, just to sort of draw out some of the more, some of the issues that you sort of spoke about um, in that chapter of the book, when you talk about how trade unions have to seriously think about the radical redistribution of power um, of often marginalised groups and their needs. Um, I thought that was a really interesting chapter, a really important chapter, um, because it talks about, it talks about why trade unions sometimes just purely focus on representation issues, they focus on things like equality and diversity measures, but that really doesn't get to the crux of the problem and the things that we need to unpack and challenge a little bit. Um, and it certainly resonated with me, especially questions about representation, because sometimes they can feel quite tokenistic and they don't, they don't actually fundamentally change the situation for, for often very marginalised groups. So I was hoping you could maybe just draw out some, some more thoughts around, around that chapter and some of the things that you were thinking about. Yeah, so it's exactly that for me, really. If I was to sum it up, it's the difference between um, like symbols and structure, I think. So I, I certainly think that most unions, as I said in the reading now, are aware and, and supportive of the fact that they need to be doing this kind of work and they need to be kind of including you know, people who've been traditionally marginalised. But I think the way that they've landed on doing that is sometimes symbolic rather than structural. So you might have... Um, you know, women's officers, or you might have um, like fringe events discussing kind of what the Disabled Workers Committee want. Um, and all of those things are good and they're necessary. I'm certainly not saying that they're negative <laughs> things. Um, you know, those the people in those positions and those discussions that have done great things and they yield great kind of conversations. But what I'm calling for is essentially a, a union movement that's structured around the most marginalized workers so where that work isn't just happening on the fringes but it's kind of right in the middle of it um and i actually think um for that reason it's probably the most challenging um chapter in the book because it's it's a bit more kind of tenuous and it's asking for something a bit bigger and more radical um but there is a chapter later on in the book that talks about um democracy and democratic structures. And I actually think those two arguments pair very naturally because I think a lot of these issues um, are addressed by sort of changing the way that we think about democracy and, and hierarchy in, in trade unions. You know, I, I continue to think it's very ironic that we've essentially borrowed the structures of our workplaces to organize our union movement. <laughs> um, you know, and there's plenty of other more creative things that we could be doing that give people kind of on the ground real power and real voice, as opposed to this kind of top-down hierarchical way of organizing things. Um, so I think, yeah, if we're kind of talking about the practical steps towards a liberatory unionism, I think that democratic question has to be a huge part of it. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it's a big challenge for the union movement and I'm not expecting kind of people to be able to adopt that overnight. I think I just wanted to plant the seed and start the, the conversation about how things could look different. And there's loads of examples that you use in the book and loads of examples that I'm sure people in the audience will relate to in terms of trade unions that actually are thinking about how they organise around these particular issues and actually doing things a bit different, which does challenge the democratic structures of a union, but for the better. Um, and, it, and it meets the needs of the people that are that are new and young, particularly coming in at the union. So hopefully we can touch on that some more as well. Um, I just want to kind of talk a little, little bit about, um, I want you to talk a little bit about, I suppose, the, the pandemic, because a lot of the book is written during the course of the pandemic um, and a lot of the, the the topics that you cover will be very relatable to people if they read the book right now. I think it's it's really, really topical. It's really good. Um, but I suppose it'd be good just to chat a little bit about um, the process involved in writing um, the, the, the book in terms of um, how easy or difficult you found getting access to workers and worker stories and some of the stories that you carry within the book. Um, and also maybe just a little bit of a discussion around some of the organising techniques that you did encounter that young workers, women particularly, um, are adopting um, at the moment, which um, I, I were talking about, I think is really important. Yeah, so when I initially 
kind of wrote the proposal and got the contract for the book um it was the end of 2019 so it didn't have anything you know to do with the pandemic in it um and then by the time I sort of started seriously getting down to kind of write it um we were like in the full throes of the pandemic so there was like a real transition to be done um and I had like a sort of moment of panic with it just thinking you know does this change everything that the book is based on because the book kind of came about off the back of this kind of existential crisis about young people not being in unions and the way the figures are kind of on this downward trend and then suddenly we saw at the kind of outbreak of the pandemic when the furlough scheme and all that was still to be announced it was certainly my whole kind of social media feed was like all people being like join a union join a union now and like people joining them as well um so I started to be like oh god does this just change everything but actually in the end I don't think it did because I think exactly as we sort of said previously I felt like um I didn't want people to just be joining a union movement that was like not ready for them essentially um so I think the in that sense, the book was actually well timed and well placed to say like, here's this moment at which people have started to think about the importance of unions and of acting collectively. Um, you know, here's the challenge for where that could go next. So um, so it, it worked out okay in the end. I had to change some of the case studies just because I thought it would be weird to release a book in the pandemic without anything about pandemic organizing, because as you say, it totally changed the, the game. So I did kind of include some um, examples of where people had organized around like furlough and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, I was lucky. I um, have written about kind of different trade union issues and industrial disputes and things in a journalistic way. So I was lucky that I had good kind of relationships with people who were up for chatting to me. Um, I would have loved to have gone out and about and like been kind of in meetings and um, at protests and on picket lines and stuff. And none of that was possible. It all had to be kind of um, like Zoom and phone conversations. But um, I still managed to speak to all the people I wanted to speak to and they were really generous with their time and um you know and they had really good reflections that came out of the pandemic as well so I think in a sense that kind of strengthened some of the contributions um so yeah it was it was a panicky moment but I think it, it uh, worked out for the best <laughs> thank you um I'm going to move on to another chapter in the book that I uh, loved and it was kind of one of my favorites it's where you talk about corporate creeps and <laughs> I think that's a great way of describing them um but the, the book talks about the politics of court um co-option and the way in which um, employers and different groups of people do try and disempower workers movements, different liberation movements, social movements. Um, and I like that you, like as they called this, a uh, co um, uh, corporate creep, but I just wanted to, I wonder whether you could talk a little bit more about um, the ideas around that and, and some of the tactics I suppose employers um, and people use to, to undermine workers. Yeah, so I'm glad you like that term because I, I think like, a really scary thing about writing a book or but particularly writing that chapter was that I felt like there was this phenomenon that I needed to name but I was like how do you name a, a phenomenon like how do, you know how do people come up with names for concepts or whatever um, and essentially I came up with this term of corporate creep to refer to the kind of um, insidious creeping of um, like bosses and corporations into the realm of trade unions so the way that they kind of actively might um, situate like employee voice committees as being like an alternative to a union, for instance, or, um, you know, the way that they might, um, I, I've had bosses that have said, um, I don't want to recognise a union because um, to me that would suggest my workers weren't happy, you know, like this kind of very manipulative um, sort of stuff that our bosses and corporations do. Um, and on the sort of corporation side, I think we're it feels particularly gendered to me is um you know people will have to kind of varying experiences of this but I feel like I've seen in the last five to ten years a huge explosion on social media of people like self-styled sort of career coaches um and like self-help like workbooks in the kind of book charts and things so I'm not like naming specific names because uh, you know those people are part of a system too I don't think they're individually kind of responsible for this whole phenomenon but you do see kind of best-selling books that are about how to how to get on at work and you know we saw kind of when Me Too happened and 
when the BBC Equal Pay scandal happened, we saw articles and we saw social media conversations that were like, you know, what do you do if you're sexually harassed at work? What do you do if you think you're not being paid equally? And I certainly didn't really see unions in the answers to those kind of debates. I saw people writing whole articles about how to do like yogic breathing and how to negotiate with your boss um, in a world that is very unfamiliar to me, this sort of idea that you might just be able to go knock on their door and sit down opposite them and have it out, um, which I think isn't the experience that a lot of us have of the workplace. Um, but I, yeah, I felt like corporate creep kind of um, encompassed a lot of that conversation that was particularly targeted, I think, at young women who are obviously dissatisfied with work because of sexual harassment, because of equal pay, because of all these issues, but who are being sold the answers individually in the form of self-help workbooks and self-styled career coaches. And, you know, you get like goal setting guides that are all beautifully kind of um, branded and like pastel colours. And, um, and it, it, to me, it just felt insidious. It just felt like, you know, of course, that's very attractive to a young woman who's looking for an answer if unions aren't there to kind of provide it. Um, so that's what I kind of was referring to by, by corporate creep and that's some of the ways that I see it happening. Um, and yeah, as I say, I do think in, in that sense, at least it's, it's quite gendered in the kind of public sense. Just as you were talking there, it's really interesting because sometimes I'll go on, a, you know, I'll just Google something about workers' rights or it might be anything that might be related to trade unions. Um, and I often find that a lot of the, the pages that come up are all corporate pages. I mean, they're not trade union pages that put out trade union analysis and our side of, you know, that argument. So that's something that maybe trade unions do need to look at as well and how they're better at some of the content that they're putting out. So, yeah, no, that's really important. Um, OK, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about strikes, because strikes are obviously very visible at the minute, particularly this week, as GMB's uh, cleansing workers, refuse workers are out on strike during COP26. But just if you scroll through Twitter, you'll see that there's loads of different arguments that people are making around, around strikes. Um, there are people that are labelling the strikes as uh, opportunistic or, uh, or political. <laughs> um, I suppose I just want to get a sense from you in terms of wh why do you think that fundamentally, I suppose, fails to understand the, the nature of strikes? Yeah, I think strikes are a really interesting thing for loads of reasons. One, because I think they are the thing that a lot of people think of when they think of trade unions and I think that that can be quite frustrating for trade unionists who are saying like we're doing all this other work you know it's not just about strikes all the time um although obviously you know strikes are great and if they work and you know we would all be there supporting them but there is a lot of other stuff happening that doesn't get the same um attention but um yeah I mean in terms of the conversations that that you see emerging about strikes um I don't know, they kind of just make me laugh. I saw one yesterday that was like, you know, I will always support the right to strike, but not when it disrupts other people's lives. And, you know, if, if that's not what a strike is, then I don't know what it is for. So um, so I, I think it points to like a real lack of kind of um, awareness and like political education among the general public about what unions are and what they're for. And, you know, the kind of attacks that we've seen on trade unions in terms of their power and the right to strike actually specifically, um, have led to a situation where like we do have kind of working class like against each other you know you have working class kind of anti-trade unionist people saying you know these greedy bin men kind of disrupting life for everyone and blah 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 but they're also someone who's on like a zero hour contract you know not having a great time at work and they unions haven't been present enough or powerful enough to be able to to join the dots for that person about kind of how related those situations are um so yeah so I think it's it's kind of points to quite a sad state of affairs I think and it, it represents you know the the kind of um as I say like attacks that have happened to unions the kind of lack of power that they've been able to exercise um that when they do sort of flex their muscles they get these kinds of responses from people um I hope that can change you know as we do see kind of um strikes like winning and working and as we see other forms of industrial action being successful um but yeah certainly every strike that i've ever covered has had exactly the same issues you know the glasgow women's strike was a, a prime example of that um where those those women who were some of the most kind of um you know articulate kind of uh 
like informed trade unionists that I've ever met you know they were able to describe their situation perfectly um but they were being kind of called in the press and on social media like pawns of the government or puppets of the union or all these different things um and I think yeah I think it's a, a sad state of affairs that um the, the public don't have enough kind of awareness or education on the whole to be able to to understand what's actually going on there yeah, absolutely. And there's a collective responsibility, I suppose, of everyone to instead of getting into like an argument with someone, but actually trying try to actually educate people around the role of trade unions and strikes. So, no, absolutely. OK, so just the last question in this section, then I'm going to kind of take some of the audience questions. But do you feel hopeful um, about some of the changes that you speak about in the book actually happening? Um, I know there is examples that you've used where things are already shifting, but just your general thoughts about how you feel about that, I suppose. Yeah, I did try to use lots of real world examples because I could imagine people saying, you know, this is just it's hard. It's like, how are we meant to do this work? So I purposely kind of included a lot of case studies. I didn't include any negative case studies. I just included loads of case studies of where this work was already happening and being successful. So I hope people read the book and think like some of these are really big ideas. Some of them are much more kind of immediately actionable, but certainly there's evidence for all of them of how they might work and what they look like. Um, but, you know, I do, I think um, if you're someone like me and like I imagine everyone in this call who believes that acting and working collectively is the way to change things, then you have to be optimistic. It's kind of like a, an oxymoron not to be. You can't say, you know, I believe the only thing that's ever changed anything is people acting collectively in their and then say but there's no change in the union movement <laughs> um so I have to I have to be optimistic and believe that it's possible I don't think it's easy you know I think it's going to require people to um to shoulder a lot of work and to um yeah to, to challenge things in ways that aren't always comfortable but um yeah I have to be optimistic because otherwise there's no point in, in writing the book <laughs> Aye, absolutely. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to a couple of questions now from the audience. Um, so the first question, I'll just get it. So the first question is about social care. So how can the union movement get social care up the political agenda? Is it perhaps, it is perhaps the most female dominated undervalued profession there is and despite heroic efforts over the course of the pandemic, it's not clear whether these workers will ever be fairly rewarded. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think a lot of it is about kind of exactly these issues we've been talking about, about liberatory unionism and the, the kind of structures of unions. Um, I don't think that social care as a sector or the interests of the majority of women who work in it have ever been central in trade unions' minds. Um, I think the Glasgow women's strike started to shift a bit of that but they have had to fight you know against years of being left on the sidelines of within their own unions as well um so i think there's there's a challenge there for for unions to say if we you know if we were to make social care our central organizing priority if we were to go out into workplaces where um you know some of the workers might never have encountered a union before because it's not a well unionized um workforce in many places um, so that that requires a leap of faith, it requires resources and time and energy to, to go out and organise those workers and to bring them into a, a union. Um, if unions were to do that, I think they would, um, I think it would reap real benefits because certainly the the social care workers that I've spoken to um, are, as I say, like really switched on, they know exactly kind of um, how undervalued they are. They're really good at making that exact case and joining those dots. So I remember speaking to the strikers and the Glasgow women strike and they weren't just saying, you know, we deserve um, to be paid the same as our male counterparts, which they obviously do and which was kind of the flagship thing. They were saying, you know, we get up at five o'clock in the morning and we turn the city on. We get everything set up before all the rest of you are out and you never see us. You know, we're invisible and um, all of this kind of thing. We're getting people up in the morning. We're, um, you know, doing all the work that other people like don't want to do and don't value because it's, you know, hard and like dirty and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and they were saying that explicitly, you know, that's what they were. That, that's the argument that they were making. Um, so they know they know what their value is they know how to kind of have those conversations and um, i think like union movement and union structures needs to value that and value them and put them very central um and then i also think there's you know there's a wider conversation and kind of role that unions can play in terms of what we 
talk about when we or what we mean when we talk about work so obviously unions were set up for kind of paid labor male labor uh, originally um but certainly unions like the independent workers of great britain for instance have organized foster care fair, uh, sorry foster carers recently which i think is a really interesting you know kind of conversation starter in terms of something that many people think should just be done um out of love you know they think that we should care for each other kind of um because it's an innate thing that women and mothers should do um but that that kind of attempt to organize foster care is i think opens a door to have a conversation about the value of unpaid work and unpaid care and um and labor and what that means um so there are, are steps in the right direction but yeah i think it has to start with union movements and union leaders like really valuing those workforces and being prepared to to go out and and organize them Great, thank you. Um, we've got a really, uh, another question in, which I think is actually a, um, quite an important question because it talks about the merging of equalities issues with other collective bargaining issues like pay and terms and conditions. Uh, but we've been asked, um, you will have seen that UCU um, members backed industrial action um, or have backed industrial action, they just got over the thresholds, I think it was announced last night, um, over four fights, so pay, casualisation, equality and workloads. Um, and Miranda is asking what our thoughts are on having four issues within one collective action and whether conversations about equality in that sector are being diluted by being included in an umbrella action or whether there is power in a more structural approach to all these at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I almost don't feel that I'm the best person to answer it because I think that a lot of these things are sort of strategic questions for the individual unions that, um, you know that that kind of um organize these actions um yeah i don't i think there's strengths and weaknesses to that i totally see the point that it could it could dilute the kind of um equality stuff but i think there's also um power in as you kind of suggested they're linking explicitly equality to issues like casualization and pay um you know so we're not just saying in the abstract we're treated worse at work because we're women we're saying we're paid more poorly and we're more likely to be on casualized contracts and we're more likely to have families to care for um, and need flexible working and all of that kind of thing so um i think in terms of joining those dots up there is strength in doing that um but certainly you know i, I would also kind of as i've said a few times in this conversation i'd also like to see it like explicit sort of equality and gender issues um given their own like space and right as well within the union movement um again i can't I don't want to speak specifically to that ucu fight because i'm not in that union i kind of haven't i've followed it you know in, in a new sense but i haven't followed the sort of ins and outs of it um but um but yeah in the union movement more widely i certainly think um there should be more space given to more space and more resource um, and time given to um, like explicitly sort of gendered issues and having those conversations. Yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely the same. I mean, I'm not a UCU member, but I think part of the criticism sometimes of trade unions and sometimes things that I've seen is that the equality based issues are treated separately. And you see that through the structures of trade unions that you've spoken about and some of what she writes in, in terms of a lot of equality based equip, uh, committees within unions are just the, their agenda and their work, work plan for the year is completely on a completely different path to some of the discussion, the industrial discussions about pay terms and conditions and all those sorts of things. So it's nice to see that, that actually quality based issues are being brought into other collective bargaining issues like paying casualization. Obviously, it's up to you to to, to make the argument for that. Um, but I think that a lot more of that is definitely welcome. And as you've said, more specific equality based actions is what's needed as well, because we know they're there and, and, and you know, it. We can't shy away from that. It's about how to be organised or using all the how to be use all the organising um, tools and tactics that we've that we've employed on various different topics on equality based issues and actually really bringing them to the fore. So, um, that that I think that's a really important question. Um, another question then. So I've got a question um, about. Firstly, uh, this person, I don't know if it's anonymous or not, so I, I don't know if I can read the name or not, but I'll just say that someone said that they really love your book. <laughs> I'll tell you later who it is, if I can. But what kind of actions do you think unions should take right now in terms of advancing political education and helping people without family traditions of trade union membership understand what a union is and what it's not, um, and what it does, sorry. So trade union education, how do we how do we how do we use that essentially? Um, 
Ah, que no. Yeah. So the political education is kind of one of the like key pillars, I think, of the book. You know, if I was to sum up the kind of unionism that I'm like trying to um, visualize in the book, it would be like a union, a union movement that does deep organizing, political education and liberatory politics. Um, and, and so what I mean by political education is like, um, you know, kind of class consciousness almost. So like people understanding when they have an issue at work, which, you know, is, is the point at which most new members will join a union is when they have a grievance. Um, doing the work to for them to recognize that it's not just an issue with them or they're like one boss or they're what happens to be a bad workplace it's a kind of structure of um of paid work right so it's like you know if workplaces under capitalism are going to operate this way it's a feature of them it's not a, a bug essentially um, and what I think we do at the moment as I kind of referred to in a previous answer is quite often um like one-on-one -on -one firefighting so someone will come with a grievance and the union will step in and they'll help them with the kind of negotiations of that and quite often they'll win which is great for that individual worker but what they don't always do is like then kind of move that worker along through a journey that says like you know here's the the structure that you're a part of here's why that happened to you here are other people who have had the same experience and like here's how you kind of go on to make things better in a like wider structural collective sense rather than just your one issue so i think how we do that practically comes in loads of different forms like in the book some of the things that people spoke to me about were as basic as like union reading like clubs union book clubs on whatsapp where they were just like um, chatting to other people about like political stuff that they've read and having their kind of views challenged and shaped and um, some of the kind of really structural ways we can do it i think are like in sort of training programs and um, so you know better than zero in scotland are really good at doing that um where they do kind of know your rights sessions and they do you know act like working collectively and they're kind of doing that education really explicitly in a sort of training session sense and then i think some of it's through kind of organizing um like tactics and how organizers operate so um there's I think this is in the book so I, you won't mind me saying it but um brian simpson who's an organizer with unite hospitality he talked to me about how when they have a um worker who comes to them with a grievance he'll quite often say you know uh, technically you're meant to be a member for a certain amount of time before I can help you but I'm going to help you anyway I'm going to help you now but your side of the bargain is that you go and you talk to your colleagues in your workplace and you get them to come along too and join this and um, join this campaign and so there's some there's stuff that organizers can be doing and there's kind of tactics that we can be using in our conversations with new trade unionists I think that are all part of that political education question um but yeah certainly I'd like to see more of it I think that's how you build new trade unionists and how you sustain a union movement and as I say how you build power rather than just acting for people kind of one-on-one -on -one all the time yeah. it was Hayley Maxwell they said that she really loved your book I just can't work tech so I'm like I can read her name it's fine um okay thank you um um another question so um Again, a really important question about, I suppose, the servicing mods of unions, but we've got a contribution that says it seems like a, a, it seems like newer movements is a focus on identifying taking action around a particular issue, even if it's not an issue they've campaigned on before, versus my own recent experience of joining a long-standing union and having been sent info about their cashback reward scheme or online shopping and life insurance, but no one has been in touch to find out why I joined or asked me to get involved. And I imagine that's, you know, the experiences of a lot of people um, and some of the criticisms of, of trade unions and things that, that need to be addressed. But maybe just some thoughts on that, Eve. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, that's what, and that, that, that's what a lot of people now expect from a union, a lot of young people. So they think if they join that it's a financial transaction where I pay my fees every month, but in return, I get, as you say, kind of cashback offers or like insurance deals or, um, you know, like, a, I don't know, discounts on a laptop or something. Um, and that I think, um, you know, I understand why unions have kind of moved to that servicing model in the face of all these kind of attacks on their power um, and ability to organize. But um, I just, you know, it kind of links to the last question. I just don't think it builds power. It just, it, well, it doesn't actually, you know, um, very obviously doesn't build power. It just kind of services people individually. You're not joining dots between people. You're not connecting people. You're not doing that sort of political education. Um, you're just kind of acting um, as a, 
you know, as a cash bank company, right? Um, so yeah, so I think, and, and that, that really basic question of like, um, when you join, like not, you know, there's not necessarily, there will be in some unions, but like sometimes you'll join a big union and you'll just join it online maybe, you'll get like a pack in the post that's not even like addressed or not even got your name on it it's just like dear new member and then there's no personal conversation you know you don't get a phone call from someone saying like why did you join what what are the issues in your workplace what are you interested in um and that's you know you can't expect kind of one person in a huge union to be doing that for all their three thousand members or however many they have but um but i do think there's a, a kind of quite a sad thing there about the moment at which people join is probably the moment at which they're like most ready to be sort of activated as unionists um, and quite often we just miss that opportunity because we've got this servicing model um so yeah I, I agree with the person who asked the question um i'd certainly like to see that shift um to the kind of organizing model that we've talked about Thank you. Um, okay, so another question, um, and this one um, talks about how, I suppose essentially how we organise around equality issues. So how can an intersectional feminist perspective be incorporated into collective organising to shift focus away from the typical breadwinner model to bring equalities issues like workplace sexist and sexual harassment or disability access to the forefront of the union. And I think your book talks about them, but there are other examples um, where unions are doing exactly that, United Hospitality being one of them. But do you want to maybe give us a wee, uh, some thoughts, some examples there? Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> I feel I'm at risk of sounding a bit like a broken record on this, but I, again, I think it is that structural question of like having kind of union structures that are democratic and open enough that those issues are able to come to the fore and so United Hospitality that you've just mentioned is a really good example of that because they um you know they have this kind of open structure where and, and the sort of political education bit where people are sort of coming through and, and becoming trade unionists and staying trade unionists and they are joining all those dots you know they've got this ongoing campaign now about um sexual harassment of uh, one of their members who was sexually harassed walking home from work because the I think the, the taxi that her work were meant to book her just didn't show up or they might have ended the taxi scheme or something I'm not sure of the specifics of that but um I think that's a really good example of where you can you know start to talk about like that woman wouldn't have been walking home on that road at that time if she hadn't had to be at work so you know it's kind of what you're saying about the UCU thing of embedding um conversations about like pay and conditions and things in in with conversations about um equalities and you know identity for want of a, a better term I suppose um so I think that that's a really good example um but yeah I think I think it's this structural question I think again the Glasgow women's strike provided a really good example of that when a union does put the the time and energy and resource and um you know like like bravery behind a, a group of workers because it is it does take bravery for a union to go ahead with strike action under the current climate and when they do that and they're willing to take that risk um it can be transformative because I think you know those women are, are still fighting for their their, um pay settlements um because you know there was a lot still to be worked out after they won that that dispute but um it was the most moving sort of industrial action that I've witnessed you know going along to report it in terms of the kind of things they were saying and the conversations they were having um, and I think it's shifted the dial people talk about it all the time in these circles you know people who are interested in equalities and trade unions um, will point to the Glasgow women's strike as being a sort of turning point or a sort of flagship moment um, because it proves it proves the, the power that you can have when unions structurally are willing to put that kind of um, energy and resource into those workforces. Um, so yeah, my uh, <laughs> again, we're back to a uh, democratic structure. <laughs> No, spot on. And another example, I think another recent example, and it's United Hospitality again, they're getting a lot of shout outs, I tell you, but it is a predominantly young workforce and they are in so many ways leading leading the way and thinking differently about how we organise as trade unions. Um, but I know that they were recently involved in a, in a campaign at the Grand Central Hotel where they got um, 55 women and men to sign a collective grievance, which forced the company to get rid of sexist uniform, which forced workers to wear skirts and heels while serving customers. 
but that also led to a big spike in sustained membership at the hotel, which still persists today. So it just shows you that if you can identify an issue um, and collectivise around that issue, that it actually builds sustained power that, 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 that our workplaces need. It does make a huge transformative difference to people's working, working environment. Um, I think we've got time for um, one more question. So I've got... Um, let me see two seconds let me find okay so there was a question about actually because we've not really spoken um about that but about the the trade union legislature the anti-trade union legislation and the thresholds and things like that so um this question is about looking at the disempowerment of unions in recent years and legal restrictions around striking what can unions actually do in that environment to challenge precarious work low-paid work particularly for women and men, uh, minority sort of groups um, I know some of these questions might be a little bit similar in terms of some of the responses, but yeah, if you could take that one. Yeah, so I think, first of all, I would say that, you know, I, as I've said, I totally recognise the kind of, um, like, uh, strength of, that's the wrong word, but like, how I, I recognise how difficult it is, right? I recognise how, how difficult the conditions are that unions are operating in and how kind of forceful the attacks against them have been. Um, I do still think there's there are things that unions can do within the law, actually. Um, you know, there's a bit, another conversation about sometimes going beyond the law because that's also changed things historically. But even within the law, there are things that unions can do to push up against those regulations without actually kind of um, overcoming them. So I think sometimes there can be a tendency to be um, like resistant to that kind of bold action because of the fear of, of, um, of that legislation. Um, and actually it pushes you too far the other way when there are, are still things that you could do within it. Um, but yeah, I think um, in terms of how we, so was the question specifically about precarious workers? Yeah, kind of women precarious workers. Um, because I think they're an, an interesting um, example because sometimes those precarious workers, if they're not um, employees at an organization, sometimes they are able to be, um, to be to kind of use other tactics because they're not under that employee kind of category. And um, so there's kind of interesting thing there. Um, and, and sometimes they also just have, in my experience and you know, from the people I've spoken to, sometimes precarious workers are actually willing to be really bold because they have um, almost less to lose because they're used to kind of um, being disposable and being like jumping around often between different employers. Um, and so sometimes they're willing to take the most kind of bold um, actions. Um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, I think it obviously makes things very difficult, but there are loads of examples recently of, um, you know, if we're talking about women precarious workers, kind of insourcing cleaning staff, particularly a lot of universities um, have had uh, strike action amongst their staff. And, you know, if we're coming back to the kind of liberatory unionism idea, their majority or almost you know, sometimes entirely female cleaning staff who are also often majority migrants, um, sometimes don't speak great English. There's loads of different kind of barriers to them getting involved and they've still managed to get in and organize those workforces and get them out on picket lines and win. Um, and that's all happened within um, you know, the last decade or so when, when that union anti-trade union legislation has been um, active and happening. So we don't always have to point at like the 70s as, as examples of strong, powerful, successful trade union action there actually is stuff happening um even against those um restrictions but i also think i also think that unions should be um sometimes i think we can be quite resigned to our fate and we can just be talking about how difficult it is to do things and you know under that legislation um and i actually think there's uh, you know if we were to kind of leverage our collective power and our tactics and methods that we've kind of learned through organizing and um, we could use them against that legislation as well and to try and like put a real kind of strength of power behind um like repealing some of that and making sure that it doesn't get further extended because you know people talk all the time about Margaret Thatcher as being the sort of architect of anti-union laws but what we talk less about is that there hasn't been any government since Thatcher who's repealed any of that legislation um or or extended um you know trade union rights in in any way um so yeah, so I think there's there's a kind of bit of work there that unions could be doing um, around the legislation itself, rather than sometimes being a bit kind of, as I say, resigned to that just being our fate forever. 
Thanks, Eve. Alice, is there time for one more question? I know there's an opportunity to pick up any questions and because there will be a podcast that, that that comes out alongside the the recording of this um, where we can answer more questions, but I don't know if I sort of if ran out of time. If you can think of a question that can be answered in one minute. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> will be. It's okay then just to leave maybe the, a, a question that's come up and then we can maybe pick it up. We'll definitely, yeah, we'll definitely revisit that. Yeah. Okay, I'll hand back to you then. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Suki. Um, and thank you, Eve. And yes, apologies to the question answer, but we will definitely be covering that in, in the podcast that we'll record a, record a little bit later. Um, thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, thank you to Suki for sharing and, and Eve for sharing her book with her. Uh, the book is available from Pluto Press, all good independent bookshops. Um, it uh, my copy has many pretty much every page has a corner folded down because there is there is so much in there that is relevant to um, the feminist movement the fight that we're, we're all engaged in so um, we'll be sending out a link to everyone with um, an email to everyone with links to where you can buy the book and also to yeah, it's, it's got 50 percent off right now if you buy it wow so um yeah so if you haven't got it yet you should definitely do it while it's cheap <laughs> <laughs> incredible excellent uh, so yeah there's there's no excuses uh, go get that we'll we'll send you out links um to the recording of this and the podcast when that's available as well um uh, Engender is a membership organisation. Uh, if you're not yet a member, please do join us as well as joining your uh, local union if you're not already a member. Um, so uh, without without anything else, I think that's it. Thank you so much for your questions, um, those that were submitted in advance and those that came in during the event. Um, thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, and thanks again to Suki and Eve.